Welcome to Ming Presents the Reup, a conversation with the artistic mind. What's up, ma'am? Hello, sir. How's it going? Good. What time is it there? Uh, eight o'clock. It was eight o'clock. And where are you right now? Uh, in the UK. That's it. That's all you're going to give me. Yeah, it, that's all I'm going to give you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw I'm, in, uh, I'm near, near Bristol. It's the easiest kind of option. Are you um, with your family? Yeah. Yeah. So I live, I live next door to my parents when I'm in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, let me try and move this. Um, is that better? No, it's yeah. better where it was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look fine. I can see you fine. Yeah, there the you beard go. has now gotten to a length though that it's hard to get it full frame, which is yeah, you quite can't get it all in. I'm trying to. There we. There we go. That's better. Uh, say one thing. <laughs> <laughs> beard problem also Apple have made these phones so big that you're just like can't do anything with it well you can't carry it in your pocket without looking like you know you're smuggling something <laughs> which isn't a bad thing I guess it helps things you know, helps, <laughs> helps things out right I always carry it in my back pocket I can't mine won't fit in my front pocket I mean I wear the skinny jeans so yeah won't, it won't fit in my front pocket at all. I'm, you know, to date myself, I grew up as a metalhead. I had really long hair down in my butt, and I would wear, like, the peg jeans back then, but they weren't comfortable. Any, you know, not like now. Like, that was yeah. a uniform, you know, like skinny jeans, black skinny jeans, a jean jacket, and all that kind of metal yeah, stuff. <laughs> and now it's, like, super comfortable to wear skinny jeans because they stretch. Yeah, yeah. Skinny jeans before they stretch. To be fair, though, I don't like jeans that stretch. Like, it, they really annoy me. I I've gone uh, I've gone back to wearing like thick, like actual jeans purely because the ones that stretch always rip. And I'm See, like, I don't have that problem. Just you must have mass. Do you, 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 I, I know you work. <laughs> at, I know you work out, so. <laughs> yeah yeah I, that's I what i meant out. i meant like i was gonna say your lower half must you know have to be very muscular <laughs> yeah very <laughs> uh but um yeah man how's how's life everything is good um i'm a little it's a little hot where i am right now because we finally just started to get some real normal spring or early summer weather and I'm at, yeah. um, I'm in, I moved my studio from the city into this little teeny space that I'm in, in right now. And behind me, you can see I have like my, my streaming set up where I've got some pretend, yeah, yeah. You know, Christmas lights and stuff like that. But it's a small spot and it's hot right now. So if I start sweating, it's, it's um, you know, it's because yeah. I'm nervous. I'm nervous, man. <laughs> is, it, um, is it getting humid out there already? Not yet. So you know New York weather, which is, I, I didn't know that you had lived in Brooklyn, and we spoke earlier, you, you mentioned that. When did you live in Brooklyn? Uh, I think it was like three years ago. And I didn't where, Williamsburg, or, or, or like... Of course, come on, man. I'm well, the fucking I most I mean, cliche in, hipster in the world. Of course it was Williamsburg. <laughs> or Bushwick. You could have lived in, if you were really hip, you would have been living in Bushwick three years ago. I'm not that hip. Um, not that cool it, enough. Is but that where I the would, beard? I would move to Bushwick now because I actually li- really like it. Um, I lived in I lived in Williamsburg. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was now, and I lived in two places. I ended up in Keeping Grand. If, I'm sure you know where that is. Um, but I actually yeah. lived in the same building as um, James Murphy from LC- LCD Sound System. Randomly, oh, really? I lived in the third floor. He lived on the second floor, or maybe it was both the other way, and. You know, like I, I was in a different musical world than he was in at that time. He was doing that electro yeah, yeah. clash, blah blah blah, and I was coming out of this hip hop and drum and bass world. And there's two of us weirdos living in this building, and we would meet on the roof and drink bourbon together. And he was a surly fuck. <laughs> and like, you know, like our worlds hadn't combined yet. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, but you that's know, why I love New York, though. Like, New York's actually my favorite place in the world. Um, so will be. I. I love that place so much and it just uh it makes me ha- like literally every time the plane lands 
in what unless it's unless it's Newark. Fucking hate that airport. But if it's like JFK or damn, what's the other airport? Uh, LaGuardia. LaGuardia, of course. Um, I just like feel automatically happy, just like touching down. And then driving in and you see the see the skyline and it, I don't know, there's something about that city. I my first time not my first time in America, but my first time like traveling America by myself. I think I was like eighteen. I went to New York and I ever since then I was just like in love with it. It's just amazing. And now you're nineteen, so it's like fresh in your mind. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I'm actually, I, I have, I'm actually I, 30 next month. Ah, happy that's, unbirthday. That's we'll remember that. That's scary. That's good. It's not good. Is that scary to you? It's not scary. Um, but I feel like 30 is like a milestone where you're like, your life should be in order. <laughs> And well, you're a DJ, so your your life is not going to be in order for a while. That's the that's the charm of being a DJ. Yeah, um, and I always set like certain goals for myself to when I was thirty. <laughs> and realistically, they were unrealistic goals anyway, which is fine. But I I just when when I was thirty, when you're like fifteen, is like old, right? If you know what I mean. And it's yes, like I do know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, so it's like. I was like, damn, it's, but I, it doesn't bother me. Um, I mean, look, you, you, you can, you can look as good as me in, in, I'm, I'm, I should not say how old I am, but I'm 48. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you looking so, good for 48, man. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying like, if you do something that you love and you take care of yourself like you do, and I do. Um, you end up you end up in a good place, and so that any things that you thought you might have needed to do at a certain age become like eh, whatever. Yeah. I never had any of those expectations on myself. I just want, I was very driven to do my music and do that you know, do that lifestyle. Yeah, no, I've I'm extremely driven, but also have huge expectations of myself. Yeah. Um, and like on a daily basis to the point where I can't even go on vacation because it just like, gets yeah, but that, that's, that's fair enough. I was the same exact way. I think there's something about being a musician and being a record producer that you have this uncanny drive to, to not want to miss a step because you feel, you can feel the slide back. And yeah. for me, it wasn't really until I met my, my current wife that I actually took a vacation ever. Yeah, yeah. I, like I would never take a vacation. It was always a working, like I'm work. You know what I mean? I DJ somewhere, maybe stay an extra week or whatever. Blah blah blah. Yeah, but yeah. She was the first person to slow, not slow me down, but to to be like, we're not going to miss anything by taking a week week off. And I was like, holy cow! I cannot believe I missed nothing. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like you still can get your stuff done, but. It takes you have to get to a certain age to feel okay about that. For me, it's not about missing anything. I couldn't give a fuck if I miss anything. The thing for me is I just feel lazy not doing studio work. Well, that's what I mean though. You're missing like missing missing the music, missing yeah. the creation, like n missing I don't know, whatever it is that we do to stay yeah, sane. Definitely. Strange. Strange. Do you think living in New York, though, like, is part of that because it's just constantly on the go? When I was growing up, my I, my parents are, are out about an hour and 15 minutes from the city, so in a place called Stony Brook. And as a kid, I would be up all hours of the night. Yeah. Being like, there's got to be other people like me who have this drive. I, and I couldn't, I never felt settled. And when I would go, when I was old enough, when I was like 15, 16, I would take the train and go into Manhattan and I'd feel calm. I feel like the energy of the city was the place where I vibrated the right speed to be in that place. So after yeah. college, when I moved there, I found the city to be the place that I found to be most peaceful for me because I was surrounded with super motivated, 
high vibrating, intellectual, interesting, crazy, weird, bizarre people. And I never felt out of place anymore. And yeah. so I think, yes, the city for me is a never ending source of inspiration because there's so much going on by so many different people. I mean, I, I can remember just walking around aimlessly in Williamsburg doing like an art crawl. They used to have these weird art crawls. Where you'd go from like art gallery to art gallery to art gallery. Yeah. And it would be brilliant to me. It was like, you know, you'd go home and stay up for two days working on music because of the brilliant artwork you saw. And it was so accessible in such a small proximity. So I do know how you feel about the city. It is, you know, it's, it's very pinnacle to who I am as a, as a music producer. Dude, I, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's a very for me it's it, it's a very special city I'll, I'll eventually end up being back there at some point in my life not too sure when but i definitely will so tell me about a little bit your locale and why you are where you are why why do you leave brooklyn and a I, I, your your touring schedule is pretty heavy so that's probably part of it right why hold a an expensive place in Brooklyn when you could have, you know, go home to creature comforts at home. But tell me about that. Why did you leave Brooklyn? And, and I, so I actually live in Detroit. Oh, you live in Detroit. Um, Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have so no I actually, idea. I actually live in Detroit. Um, and it, I, so, so what happened is I, what I would used to do, obviously I'm from the UK and I always, always lived in the UK all my life. Um, and when my career started becoming busier as a DJ, I, most of my shows are still in the U US. So what I would do is I would come over and rent a place for like four, five, six months at a time and just do my touring and then go back to the UK and then just go back and forth. Um, but it got to the point where I was just touring so much i was literally every weekend in america and i needed a place full time so i i'd left new york i'd finished my tour i'd left new york and then i did i can't remember when it was it was around movement three years ago um so that would have been in may so i was needing to come back to america full time for pretty much the rest of the year um, and I was thinking of going back to New York and I was looking at prices. And the thing is I needed, when I was living in Detroit, I didn't have a studio. Um, I didn't have like my own place. I just rented a room like everyone else does. Um, and I really just didn't want to be in that situation. Not that I didn't enjoy it, but I wanted my own place. I wanted a two bedroom place. I wanted a pl the reason why I wanted two bedroom is so I can have a studio really. Yeah. Um, and I was looking and I, I'm, I'm, I've gone past the point in my life. I still do it if I have to, but I've gone past the point in life where I was going to live in some like shit hole because <laughs> like I, well, I'm, <laughs> when you're touring three, three, four days a week and you, the only time when you're at home, you want to actually be in a nice place. Right. I, like, so I was looking at places and you're looking at, you're looking at like three and a half to six grand a month. In really, New York. Yeah. In New yeah. York. And I yeah, was yeah, yeah. like, I was like, do I, I, I could do so much better with that money. Like, I don't agree with renting anyway. It's not, it's something that just from my childhood, I've just never, my parents, like they always kind of drilled into me to like try and buy a, buy a house, et cetera, et cetera. So I was at movement one year. Do you know, do you know Jen Lyons? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So Jen was, we were actually at Claude Von Stroke's house, parents' house. They live in Detroit. Um, we were all having breakfast and Jen was there. Cause obviously Jen does a lot of the stuff with, or used to do a lot of stuff with Dirty Bird. Um, and, Jen was like, Will, I've just bought like an apartment block in Detroit. Like That's crazy because I had that idea year like I used to go to Detroit and yeah. see these blocks of townhouses and be like, 
if I could just get five of my friends to buy on the we on the ends, we could build into the middle and just rest restore a block. So go yeah, on. yeah. So, so she did she, that. She bought an apartment block in Detroit, which is kind of near the new center area, which is it's still a little bit ghetto. It, well, when I moved there, it was still a little bit ghetto. But it, there was some beautiful property. There's some beautiful places in in uh, in Detroit generally. It's it's an insane city. I love it. But I so I moved there, and it, dude, I was paying like five hundred dollars a month rent. Of course. And I'll be honest, like <laughs> this is funny actually. So when she bought it, it was like hood, like the apartment block was hood as fuck. There was like crack dealers in there. There was pimps in there. There was everything. So I moved in there. I was just this like little white boy going in and there was like a pimp upstairs and the crack dealer <laughs> down, down the road. <laughs> you were set. Your yeah. name was made. <laughs> but um, it wasn't like, I knew that it wasn't going to be a place that I could just be for for a long time. So I did like a month and a half there and ended up getting a place downtown um and i don't know if you've been to detroit for a long time but i don't know when the last time you went but detroit's kind of developing slowly really nice but it's slowly developing yeah. obviously it was a bag of shit for years and it just kind of just got <laughs> literally like it, it's it's super sad to be fair because it used to be the wealthiest city in america and the the car industry fell out of his ass and then it got left really everyone yeah. forgot about it fuck gentrification i know i saw that there's some people saying hello to you but it's um it's it, i call it, it's a gully city that's the way that i look at it like i live in harlem and harlem is still pretty gully it got gentrified yeah. to a degree but there's still a lot of like crazy there's still crackheads there's still you know like hoes and stuff walking around like stuff that you don't see in other parts of the city i lived in hell's yeah, kitchen yeah. the first when i first moved to the city on 43rd street and on that street there was literally a transvestite diner called the edelweiss diner where on the bottom was this weird tranny club where businessmen would pull up in their you know like business attire and pick up yeah. these trannies at the end and like i lived on that and then that and there was crack dealers and like all kinds of weird like hookers giving hand jobs on the street like it was mind-blowing <laughs> right but that's what i could afford at the time and i was so yeah. glad to be in the city and for me i was a freak anyway so i was like yeah whatever you know that's the wildlife of being in new yeah. york so you yeah that's that's the thing about new york is kind of every like new york is a very open city like you can kind of just be free and be who you are and be what you want to be. And hundred percent. No one's going to judge. It's kind of the same as Bristol. It's kind of the same as London. Same as like Berlin, like any major city is like that. Um, but Detroit was so bad. Like I remember going there at six. Um, damn. Yeah. Nearly six years ago on my first tour. And you wouldn't even really walk. Da- you wouldn't walk down walk around downtown if you know what i mean it wasn't safe to walk around downtown that's the difference is like when people would say fuck gentrification well <laughs> it, that's, that's not gentrification i don't want to be shot walking around going downtown it's like i'd rather it be safe for people to enjoy the city and things like that yeah um, so yeah i ended up moving downtown uh and when i moved downtown it was like it was still up and coming. There was still like, it's, it's still a ghost town. Like no one really lived downtown then. That's like so, what Williamsburg used to be like, believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. And there was like no grocery stores there. Like the closest grocery stores was like a Whole Foods, like two miles away. I didn't have a car and I was like, why the fuck am I like, I'm paying over what I should be paying in a, in a one bedroom apartment it was a great apartment, but I didn't have a studio. My studio was in the lounge. I was just like, this is ridiculous. So I ended up just buying a house there. Um, and I, I bought in, bought in a neighborhood outside of the city, like in Detroit, but outside of downtown. Um, because property prices, believe it or not, are insane in Detroit. Like downtown and midtown is kind of just too expensive 
for what you're getting. Um, so I bought in a neighborhood and it's still, it's a really nice neighborhood, but it's also still pretty ghetto. But I have this dope house that I have a studio. Uh, I rent a room out to a couple and he's like, he's a huge, well, he's like a fucking amazing techno producer, like super underground techno. His, his name's Un, U-U-N. So like, it's just been really good. And I've been there two and a half years, um, coming up three years in August. So that's kind of how I ended up in Detroit. Um, yeah. And obviously since Rona got in town, I just decided to come back home and spend time with my family. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I have, I have, I have two kids. I have an eight year, eight and a half year old and a five year old. Um, so when things started to get crazy in the city as they got crazy pretty quickly, mm. uh, cause you know, New York was the hot, hot spot. We have this place out in Sag Harbor and we were basically like, I think we got to leave fast. Yeah. And we packed the kids up and just hightailed it out of the city and, you know, just to be like, let's get out before they shut the city down or something crazy happens. And then a week and a half later, after we were out, um, we, my wife and I decided we were like, we're not going back until this is really over, over. And I went back yeah, and I got yeah. my studio and I moved my whole studio out here and I got more stuff for the kids. And, you know, it's, it's, it was weird how fast it happened for us so that I didn't get that much time to think beyond. It was sort of like fight or flight. We were, we were just like, okay this is the game let's go and we were very lucky to have somewhere else to go but we you know like i have my family and my mom is out on the island and my wife's mother lives next door to where we are right here yeah yeah, yeah. so same situation and pretty much everyone i've connected with since this has all happened has had the same, same experience thing. like yeah, if you yeah. could go back to family they've gone back to family because people were afraid of getting stuck by themselves and um i know a couple of musicians who actually just you know they they um, they stayed at home together because they were afraid of, you know, like being stuck by themselves in a one bedroom apartment. And, and yeah. so I'm, I'm hoping really cool things happen from that. Someone posted yeah. a, a something, something before, um, all right, someone pro listening to you guys talk about ghetto neighborhoods is so out of touch and really feels slightly racist. Please check yourself. All right. I'm going to respond to that. Cause I think you, you, you <laughs> you, you, that's, you don't, even, don't even need to respond to that don't respond it's, to these people it's just not worth it it's it's just a silly thing i all right i'll let it go i'll let it go it's not worth it i think these the perspective on how people like us live is 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 a little a little skewed by the ideas of some how some other people live i think that's the best way of describing to, to respond to that um what was i about to say before i got sidetracked <laughs> you were talking about how people were kind of moving in with their families and kind yeah. of going back here. For me, I mean, it for was you. like for, for me, it was like I I I don't really get time to spend time with my family or like long periods of times. So like I hadn't been back since Christmas. Um, and I wasn't supposed to be, I was going to be away for like four months. Um, so I was just like, I, I love being able to get back here. I love where I live in the UK. I'm super lucky. Um, I, I want you to talk about that a little bit more. Cause I saw some pictures, whether it was on your, your Instagram feed or something with a lot, some animals and it was, were you at home? Is that where you live? Like in a very yeah. lush, I dude, also, one amazing, sec, you one sec you called neighborhoods ghetto and dirty dude i didn't one sec i didn't no one has ever called anything dirty and yes my next door neighbor's house got shot up last year it's ghetto <laughs> deal with it i've lived in um, so that's what i was gonna say is i lived in manhattan i've lived in manhattan since 1996 i think and i've lived all around manhattan in in different areas and when I moved to Harlem, it's the only place I've ever been on where people have been shot. And three people yeah. have been shot and killed on my block. There are crackheads and there's needles on the ground. And I consider that to be ghetto. 
the people who live there with me and our neighbors and all of the people that I know, I know more people in Harlem than I've ever known in the city ever. I know all of my neighbors. Everyone is super friendly. Those people are wonderful people. That's right. not, those people are not what we're talking about when we refer to a ghetto situation. A ghetto situation is when people run up on you with crack pipes, when people run up on you with guns, that's, that's not normal behavior. So don't conflate the two of those things. It's not cool to do that. Neither of us have said, like you said, neither of us said anything like that. The people where we live are wonderful. That Sorry. behavior is not wonderful. <laughs> Seriously. If I didn't, if I didn't like the people where I lived, I wouldn't live there. We wouldn't live there. We wouldn't put ourselves in that situation. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, I I got my, right you, no more attention to you. You're just gonna, you're gonna thread the needle with that nonsense. Stop. Um, <laughs> Paul Flart. Okay, so Paul Flart, you need to go check out his Instagram. This dude will make any bad day your happiest day ever. Okay, well, so when you come off this, go and check out Paul Flight. He's a good mate of mine. But I found I actually found him through, I think Vice did a documentary on him. Get out. Um, and he, dude, is literally the funniest. So this guy is very, like, man humor, uh, not being sexist. Don't jump on it, that God guy. Um, but uh, he literally just films himself and he just farts <laughs> <laughs> so, so my eight-year-old will love it oh um, dude you, every you will love it i literally show everyone his uh i literally show everyone his profile and i think i'm actually getting him on my podcast soon just That's to, just, i love that and he came uh paul paul flat his real name's not paul but i don't know if he kind of says his real name online um but he came to one of my shows in orlando he drove like two hours to come to one of the shows and he, him and his mate were like nicest guys ever like have have somebody's persona online you like they seem cool as fuck and they actually are cool as fuck in real life like yeah 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 yeah. but yeah go check him out um, I'm, into, I'm so excited now. I guess I'm going to just pause this whole thing and go over there and check that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a, you know, and I, and personally, this is a funny thing. I really don't like meme culture. I, I don't find it that appealing. Um, I don't know what it is. Some, some memes really just feel like a waste of the oxygen in the room for me, but there's a couple of people who m like do you know, humor on Instagram and, and vine before that that really like rub me the right way and i'm hoping that this is one of those things like it's like so simple but so genius and so amazing literally yeah it's amazing um all right paul if this isn't any good i'm just gonna i'm gonna this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so yeah I, I where i live in the uk is like in the middle of nowhere um and it's just my parents live on like an old farm it's beautiful super lucky um have like zero neighbors i get to go on walks in the countryside uh i set up like a little gym in the field in the stables I, that's what i saw i saw shoulder yeah. day i saw yeah. shoulder day so let's talk about working out a little bit because okay. um i think a lot when i started djing and all that there was not really a system like there is now there it wasn't like it was it was very renegade you know, yeah. early, like early UK rave scene, the same kind of thing. Very renegade, not a lot of places to play that had proper sound systems. It was like whatever. And so, you know, the, the touring life was kind of pretty unhealthy relative. I mean, the most we would get out of it is like, I don't know. But now I'm very conscious of, of all, you know, of staying healthy and the other guys who do while they're touring. And you're really up on that. How, yeah. do, you, how do you stay healthy in, in terms of do you drink? Do you do all that other stuff? You don't drink. No, I don't do anything. I haven't haven't drunk for nearly nine years, I think. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, nearly. Uh, come, yeah, about nine years. That's well, why you can get up and work out before you get on that plane and do all that other stuff. I mean, but, yeah, but that's I, great. Yeah, I, for me, I've always just been into sports. When since I was a kid, I used to play rugby. It for me, like my career was either rugby or music that was kind of my decisions and what i wanted I was to baseball do. or music so that yeah. I had a similar path it's similar yeah so it's like for me 
it's it was just it's just a no brainer. I don't want to go on a plane being hungover, and I don't want to <laughs> have to play a show after not having any sleep and being hungover and having to party again to just get over the hangover yeah. or, the or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I've just always wanted to keep fit and healthy. So I, when I'm on the road, I, depending on what time I get to the hotel is I will generally just go straight to the gym um, and then go do dinner and then um, go to the club really. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of my routine. And then during the week, it's I literally have to go. I go to the gym every day of the week, and when I'm not touring, um, and do some sort of guy. And I cook a lot, so obviously, you know, as you know, when you're on the road, you're eating out a lot, and it's not good. Especially for you. in America, unless you're coastal yeah. in America, it's really rough to eat healthy, and it's brutal on your body. I don't. People, I think, have this assumption. There's a very glamorized version of what being a touring musician is in general, and flying really has takes a toll on your body. And in a, in a, in a, you know, you're dehydrated. The long flights really kill you. The sleep is bad. You get sick a lot if you're not careful. Um, you know, wah, 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 DJ problems. But you know, if you think of it, if, if 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 a businessman was telling you the same thing, where they had to fly five nights a week and they were getting, you know, so I, I think it's it's tough to stay healthy and it's tough to, to really, you know, focus on your, on your body and all that while you're touring, but it's good that, yeah, you, I think I saw that you made, you have that will makes you hungry. I didn't know that you, that was a thing that you did. I just noticed yeah. that before. And I was like, that is some straight up funny just because you separated it and made it its own blog. Like it's a pet. Yeah. It's at, I actually used to post loads of food pictures on my Instagram and it just got to the point where like I have, kind of slight OCD when it comes to like things looking right <laughs> and the food wasn't fitting on my page. I got you. It just threw the whole thing off. Yeah. Well, beards so and was, food on the same page aren't like necessarily the, the, you know. Yeah, it just didn't, didn't fit. So, and like I was doing loads of food stories of me cooking and going out and obviously like I'm like traveling a lot. We also, I also do get to eat some very good food in certain places so i want to like show people um and like when you go I, to japan i'm always when i go to japan I, I just if you've never traveled for any reason you can go to japan right yeah it's mind-blowing the attention to detail on things such as like baking the breads yeah. the little like the presentation it's so nice to be somewhere where people take their that thing serious it's a very weird culture relative to you know a, a, an american culture because of the sort of the how the working system works you know yeah, but, yeah yeah but in terms of art and food and everything i'm always blown away at you know the presentation even like when you take the bullet train and they come down the middle of the bullet train with a cart and everybody's super polite and they you know they have the little dish the food and and they I give you a little that. hand wipe to wipe your hands down it's genius that that the japanese culture is just something that's that's another place that I would live if I had more work in Asia. I would I would I considered living in Tokyo, but I had a good friend who lived there with his with his wife and he said that like it was very difficult for Gaijin to to, to be in that culture. To you know, I white think, people I, to be there. I think you have to just learn the language and be part of the fully be in, immerse yourself in the culture. I don't know, but I've got a lot of friends that live there now that I've kind of no, it's not a lot, but I say like a handful. I know a fair amount of people that live there and they're Japanese, but it's, I think you just need to fully immerse yourself into that culture. I um, think as, as almost any culture, if you're going to live there though, it's to be fair because totally. I get it, but they're particularly, what would happen with them is that she, I would get into a cab with her and she was Japanese and she, we, she would say to tell them where we wanted to go and they would pretend they didn't understand her because really? I was in the cab. This is years ago. I mean, well, I'm not. Yeah, I've you know, never experienced. That. I've only started, I, I, been started going since last year. All so. right. But I'm sure you know, everything becomes we're so globalized now. But that was one of the funny things that we would run into. That was the first place you don't drink. But I, I am a big whiskey fan. Yeah. And I, I whiskey is huge. I went to I went to my friend Eric was there. and He's like, I'm going to take you to this bar. 
and there you're going to have this unbelievable experience. So I'm like, yeah, whatever. We go to the bar. I order a whiskey. I order one of the Japanese whiskeys, which had just started to come out at that time. Yeah. A guy comes out with a, a square block of ice, like a, like a perfect cube of ice. Yeah. He puts it on this little pedestal. It's just me and Eric and like a couple other people at the bar. He chips it down with a hand chisel until it's a perfect sphere. He picks it up with these tongs. And at this point, my mind is blown. I'm like, oh, my God, he's just chipped a round cube. And if anyone knows anything about scotch, a round, the idea of a round cube is that it melts at the same rate and so that the water to scotch ratio stays the same as you drink it if you drink yeah. it at a certain rate. So it, it, it's a little bougie, but whatever. It's, you know, it's a creature comfort. So he <laughs> takes it and he puts it on top of the scotch glass and it touches the rim. It, like, barely just sits on the glass and then two seconds later, it slides into the glass. Like, that's how close. He chipped it so it would <laughs> sit on top and then slide down inside of the glass. And I was like, only in Japan will someone be that skilled to do that. And I they, was, they, like, gr- they, like, sell, they, they grow like strawberries and then sell them for, like, $200 a strawberry. <laughs> but these strawberries are, like, the most perfect beautiful tasting strawberries in the world and you're like this is on another level um but it's just it's such a such a strange culture which is is so different to any other culture i've kind of witnessed yeah and i haven't witnessed a lot if i'm it's like i i have i've traveled a lot but i haven't fully witnessed that many cultures but it's so i there's no comparison at all no i i I find that yeah it's a very very special place and i really like when you leave tokyo and go to osaka and then down to kyoto and as you go down like that's that transition from the modern to the old is really special where you'll be like you'll see like a high rise right next to an old temple a buddhist temple or something or it, you know, it's it's like New York. It's got this weird vibe to it. The one thing I was going to say about New York, just to digress, was that thing when you fly back into New York. I lived in New York when we still had the, tra- the, the Twin Towers. Yeah. And I actually shot my second album, my second album, um, The Human Condition. The photos for The Human Condition were shot on top of the Trade Center. Yeah. So, like, we have pictures on top of that. But when we used to fly back in, it was like you would see these two monoliths and you would just have this feeling right of like coming in and that landing in jfk or laguardia and that's you know it's very similar but you reminded me of that before tell me a little bit about all we have is now because sorry what's up mike how's it going man it's uh that's mike from camel fat everyone say hi hey mike <laughs> um all we have is now so yeah it was a, the label that i started this year um i was working on it all last year on the planning um but i just got to the point where i wanted to release my own music under my own imprint and just really just be able to do what i what i want to do without having to kind of go in the studio and write a record and be like oh this is going to fit on this label or this is going to fit on that label and kind of change my sound or merge my sound. So it fits on somebody else's label. Yeah. Um, And also for me, I've, I've been super lucky that I've worked with some amazing record labels um, and I've had some, huge support over the years and i just wanted to be at the point where i can give that back to other artists eventually um and i also think that since since spotify and apple music kind of is one of the biggest powers in our industry now um although there's pros and cons to it i think some of the older labels aren't so as strong on those platforms and i don't think it's a label that's that's necessarily uh, it, you so what used to happen and tell me if you you disagree but you would kind of get clout from a label yeah 100 um, percent. i mean some labels have good clout and but i find that smaller labels have better clout now if they if, if the music is curated properly well i i also think it's not necessarily 
always about the label now because like on Spotify and Apple, it's not, you don't have a label profile. Right. Right. It's just the artist. So the artist can do their own thing. And if the artist does what, like an, like an artist can release a record and have insane streams on Apple or Spotify without being signed to a big label or anything like that. Yeah, it's, it's um, democratized listening. So if, if, if something's going to bubble up, it can really bubble up. Yeah. So it was just like, I just wanted to be, I, I, I think what it, what also what I realized is that I just wanted to be like accountable for everything I do. And I want to have control over everything I do. Um, because th when it comes to like, obviously you'll know, like when it comes to touring and releasing music, like most of the time you want to release a record and plan a tour around it or release an EP or release something right. and pl plan a tour around it. And when you're dealing with labels, you never know if, the date that they give you is actually going to be the date that it's going to come out or if it's going to be knocked forward or if it's actually going to be this year, if you know what I mean, you might have to wait another six months. And yeah. And then me, sometimes was, records you're making are, are more for now than for six months from now, or even a year, like you make them cause they're kind of immediate. There's some things that I find that production, some of the productions, the non vocal oriented productions that I do there, I try to, make things that I would want to play in a club currently within a certain period of time. And then if I do something with a vocal, I, that's something that can live longer. And I find the same pain. Like if you sign something and it, it sits for a year, it loses a little bit of the luster sometimes of what you're, for me, the, the, the timing and attention, you know? Yeah. For me, it's like, um, I don't know. I, the records that I'm releasing on All We Have Is Now are records that don't fit on other people's labels. Like, You Take Me High, I don't know if you've heard that record. Yeah, I have, yeah, yeah. Like, I, it just wouldn't, when I was like, who, who should I send this to to release? Like, it doesn't fit anywhere. And... I just wanted to be able to release that by myself. And then with Hallelujah, that's just come out. I would say that could fit on a couple of labels, but also it, it's a Will Clark sounding record. So I mean, look to your, to you, not in your defense, but in all honesty, I think that your records at this point are of a quality that, labels can stretch to fit you in regardless of whether it fits their core sound i don't mess i i so i kind of disagree about the other the first record i think that could have been on a bunch of labels good labels but i i i know what it means to release music on your own label or release records on labels that you have a lot more control yeah because then if the record does well it's because of what you did and because of what your team did and not because or let me say, not because if it does well, if it doesn't do well, you can at least feel that, you know, you tried your best. When you put a record that you really care about on someone else's label and you don't feel that it's giving, it's been taken care of properly, that's not a great feeling. And when that, ha when that happens a lot, I think that that's when you start to say to yourself, why am I working so hard to fulfill someone else's creative vision when I really should be responsible for what I started in the first place? And sometimes we don't have enough time to do that. But you know, I started a couple of labels over the of, over my career, and I I feel exactly the way that you feel. I also do do it for scheduling. Yeah, because I like to be able to say, I've changed my mind about when this release is going to come out. I'd like to sw swap this other record in my schedule and do that instead of that. And I have yeah, a couple yeah. of labels that I work closely with that allow me to do that, or we work together, and and that makes it makes it more pleasurable for me to plan that way as opposed to waiting for somebody to allow me to to release the music. Yeah, also, my thing is that on a record label, and this, isn't, this is just a sign of the times of how it is nowadays, 
you have two weeks for your record to do pretty well. Right. And uh, with Spotify and with Apple and with Beatport, like Beatport is still the same. Like you have to do pretty well in those two weeks, but with Spotify and Apple, like you might start getting playlists like a month after it coming yeah. out. Um, and it takes time and people have to work it. And the thing is, there's not enough money for labels to make, to allow somebody to be working on that one record and pushing that one record and doing what labels are supposed to do for eight weeks, which is how long I personally think a, a, a label should should work on a record for. Like, You Take Me Higher, we, we're still working on that. Yeah. And... We were we actually pushed my second release, Hallelujah. We pushed that back another two weeks or three weeks for the release to give you take me higher actual time for it to to come out. Um, so, and that's the thing is, is it's the joys of having my own label is that if there's a record that's doing particularly well, I can be like, no, let's push the other release back, or if yeah. it's <clears throat> And and yeah, I can release anything I want, <laughs> really. Yeah, um, that's good. I mean, I, I'm, you're one of a, another handful of guys I've seen sort of <clears throat> take either start labels within the last year and a half or take labels back. I have Billy Kenny coming up, and he, you know, I think he's the sole owner of uh, of the St. Bristol now, and I guess he's changing the sound of all of that. You know, people are trying to find homes new homes for their things right so that that aren't so controlled someone posted about that that a lot of labels are trying to incubate artists and kind of like trying to like be a dj school for them um i'm aware of a lot of labels doing that but they're also helping young artists get their tracks sounding right and sometimes helping them they see the vision in a track that isn't quite there yet mix wise or isn't quite there format wise um, I think i think it's about mentoring like yeah i'm i'm about to do a post next week about artists bringing artists on to all we have is now for next year and i want to be able to be at the point where i can help mentor people and kind of get them to the point where their records are what like what they want and that i can sign if you know what i mean and i feel that the production level is at the point that where i know that i can sign a record and i know that my team can make it do really well if you know what I mean. Um, well, you can try. I'm going to give you, I'm going to, what I'm, I'm just going to back up for you because I sometimes think wonderful records with great people behind them still just don't stick. And it's not the label or the artist's fault. Sometimes they just fall at the wrong time. You know, 95% of releasing records is luck. <laughs> the right place at the right time where somebody else releases something that takes out the oxygen from your release, you know? Yeah. And I haven't, I haven't had, I, I personally wouldn't say I've had a hit record and I've had successful records. I've had records that have done well, but I haven't had a record that's changed my career, if you know what I mean. And yeah. not many people have, if you, like at all. But the difference between, it, uh, uh, I, think you, I think nowadays you can make a record bigger by working behind it compared to what you used to be able to like you used to, with it back in the final days it would either just be a fucking good record and people would sell it and buy it and it was just fucking massive um but now i think with streaming and things like that you can kind of work your way into playlists and you can do social media kind of marketing and things like that and it kind of turns it more into you can make something do reasonably well yeah i i do agree with you that the b ports of the world the the dj sites you have a very limited window of success and if the track doesn't chart very quickly there's really no way to get it moving on the dj sites but i have found that oddly enough tracks that didn't do well on Beatport have done super well for me in Spotify um, over a longer period of time. And then tracks that I killed it for killed it on Beatport 
really good charting positions, did really well with great sales, barely moved the needle on Spotify. Yeah. And I was surprised that it didn't translate with all the people playing that record. It was very like, so I've, I've been less worried about connecting those dots these days and more like worrying about like just getting the music to the right people and just letting the tracks have their life and pushing them as best as I can. I think um, Spotify and Apple as streaming services as much as they're great services, I just don't think they correlate with club music. Yeah. Um, so if your records have some sort of accessibility, they are probably going to do pretty good. Um, but you might have, like, there's so many fucking amazing club records that I absolutely love that people have released. And they're not even they don't even get like twenty thousand streams yeah but it is what it is it's because they're releasing a seven minute record and <laughs> the, the, the algorithms just don't allow it yeah so i think that's the battle you either take you, it's the battle you either choose to take or you give up to the system and be like okay i'm gonna put edits out and in the first 15 seconds i'm going to make sure something different happens rather than just a kick drum right and i i always do all of my stuff on spotify since i got hip to that i do the spotify edit which we you know i make for spotify and it gets to the meat as quickly as possible and it gets out between 3 15 and 3 30 unless it's a track that i've done in a genre that i don't really feel like that's okay to do I did something like a, prog a, prog a progressive tech track where I was like, I'm not doing an edit, edit of it because it's not really that kind of music where we're yeah. just going to get in there quick enough. And it didn't do very well on Spotify, but I, I wanted people to be able to find it that way and just listen to it for a longer breath as opposed to this get into the meat and go, you know, the, like okay. the A&R shuffle kind of thing. Um, I wanted to do something kind of silly. Where I know, this happened to me last time I was on live is that it, it kicks you off at exactly an hour, I think. It doesn't okay. like to go past it. So we have seven minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask you some silly questions. You go can answer it. them or not answer them. Go for it. Faith or science? Science. Rave or festival? Rave. Ocean, lake, or desert? Ocean. Music or money? Music. Big room or small room? Depends. Um, I'm going to skip. I went, what's, your, what's your superpower? Teleport. Teleport. <laughs> How would you incorrectly describe your job? Oh. Adult entertainment. <laughs> adult entertainment. <laughs> adult entertainment. I love that. Um, what animals should survive if only one can survive? Monkeys. Monkeys. Um, cat or dog? Dog. You kind of answered this before, but if not music, then what? Fashion. Oh, fashion? Okay. Not rugby? Or, no, not anymore. Not anymore. I'm okay. I fucked my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> you got pushed out. Um, yeah. Favorite meal? Indian. Indian. This good curries in, in the UK. Insane. So insane. I love going to... The first thing I do when I get to the UK, when I get to London, is go get a curry. Yeah. You cannot, you can't it's not do that. I was actually uh, walking around the village earlier and saw uh, Maboob, who owns the local Indian. Fucking legend. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter or gatherer? Hunter. What's the last gift you gave someone? Whoa. I actually bought my mum some flowers today. Will. It's delightful. That's a right? wonderful answer. I don't usually judge the answers, but that's a wonderful answer. I love it. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite deli? Because you lived in Brooklyn for a little bit. Did you, did you partake in deli culture? Yeah, and I can't remember the name. It's in manhattan and it's like the old one of the oldest jewish ones you're talking about um on the lower east side to our cats deli it's num. is it like number five <sighs> famous jewish deli in manhattan Sorry, that's like every you. deli that's like saying yeah i know second after is it no it's not yeah, second, second after. avenue deli yeah it's not that i thought it was cats maybe a cats deli but 
Frankel's is really good though. Yeah. See, that's uh, for me. Just so I say this uh, every time: if you have a favorite deli, you are a New Yorker. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you know your deli spots, you're a New Yorker. You can be from anywhere, but once you come to New York and you realize that all delis are not created equal, and you find like your egg sandwich and your like True. those things you need, then you're a New Yorker. What, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know your musical taste, but do you have a favorite metal band, or did you have a favorite metal band ever? Not metal, no. All right, and this is my favorite question because this is something that my wife and I always ponder. But what genre are the Talking Heads? Mm, one set. <laughs> I'm just going to listen to them quickly. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> like... Just pop music. Pop music. All right, that's not a bad answer. They came up on a classic rock playlist the other day on Spotify, and I was like... They're no, not classic no. rock. Classic rock is. Yeah, yeah. These are more like eight. It's more like eighties. It's like eighties rock pop. Rock, yeah, like Roxy, like Roxy music. Roxy music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, anything you want to uh, shout out? Things that are coming up. Anything you know? Just on the last little bits. No, if you want to go check out my label, all we have is now official on Instagram. Uh, my food page at Will Makes You Hungry. Um, <laughs> What's that dude's page again? The, the one Paul's what? Paul Flart. P A U L F L A R T. Flart. One. Flart. Yeah, go check him out. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Really, man. this is Thanks brilliant. I really me. appreciate you doing it, man. I'll speak to you soon. Be safe. Be safe. You too, man. Give your mom a hug. Big love. Take care. Bye.